Chapter 4 From Pompeii, we hitchhiked to the port of Brindisi, and using the very last of the cash we had managed to hold on to, sailed to the Greek island of Corfu, the ancient Corsaira, written about by Homer in the Odyssey. Each day there I would wander alone onto a mountainside that bloomed with olive and fig trees. Looking out over the Ionian Sea, I sat under a pomegranate tree and read the book of Tao, the Bhagavad Gita, and the Bible, eager to learn as much as possible from various teachers. Breathing the fresh Mediterranean air inspired contemplation. We crossed the mainland and hitchhiked toward Athens. As we soared along the roadways, I marveled at the unique terrain, language, and customs of Europe. I had come from the American Midwest, and the varieties were mind-expanding to me. I gazed through the window and found myself lost in contemplation. All my life I had been conditioned to interpret reality a certain way according to the culture in which I was raised. Why was it that we humans seemed to have a deep-rooted proclivity to feel superior to others, particularly in regard to nationality, race, religion, or social position? We think that our condition is normal and others are strange or inferior. This judgmental pride degenerates us into bigotry or sectarianism, generating hatred, fear, exploitation, and even war. I prayed that my travels would open my mind and provide sympathy for how other cultures viewed life, the world, and God. After reaching Athens, I wrote a letter to my family in suburban Chicago, telling them where I was, of how much the trip had meant to me, and how close I felt to them. I did not have the heart to tell them yet that I didn't want to return to school that fall, that I didn't know when I would return. In Athens, Gary and I were shocked to see the police waving automatic machine guns while patrolling the streets. We knew we should sleep at a youth hostel rather than under a tree. But there was a problem. Our meager finances were exhausted. Although youth hostels were cheap, we still could not afford one. So we turned to the practice of many hardcore travelers of the time, donating blood at the government blood bank. The primitive process used was painful. They strapped us to a table and then drew the blood in large syringes. We almost blacked out. It was a rule that each donor was given a cup of orange juice and had to sit in a waiting room for half an hour after giving blood. Only after seeing that the donor was in stable health did they pay. In the waiting room, biding our time, Gary and I endured the pain in our arms. He grimaced, lamenting, there must be a better way to make money than this. We looked around the room and noticed a French man with a guitar case in the same agony. A few seats down sat a Swiss boy with a violin case, he too holding his arm. As usual, I carried my harmonica strapped to my belt. We musicians looked at one another and smiled, having the same inspiration. The Swiss boy, it turned out, was trained from childhood as a classical violinist, but as a teen opted to play rock and blues. The French guitarist was likewise trained in classical flamenco, but converted to folk music. After collecting our blood money, we streamed out into the street and forming a makeshift band, began to play a wild improvisation 
of 12-bar blues. A dozen people gathered around us and danced. Soon it grew to dozens more. Gary became our rhythm section by dropping a few coins into a borrowed hat and shaking it. So pleased was the audience with our performance that they continually tossed drachmas, the Greek currency, into Gary's hat. As the enthusiasm mounted, we formed a musical procession down the streets of Athens, playing one long song. The crowd skipped along behind us. When we stopped at a corner, dozens assembled, and the hat overflowed with drachmas. At the end of the first day, we divided our earnings and checked into the youth hostel. By the next morning, we were famous. Wherever we went, crowds were smiling. Clapping Greeks gathered around us in a circle. They loved us. We joyously played on, thinking it too good to be true. At one plaza, our music filled the air. Old folks clapped, teenagers danced, children jumped, and mothers swung their babies to the rhythm. Everyone smiled on that sunny afternoon, and the hat overflowed. Until all of a sudden, the crowd abruptly dispersed. The music stopped as machine guns were thrust into our faces. We were arrested and hauled off to the station. There, the police confiscated all the money from the hat and warned us to never commit this crime again. That was the beginning and the end of my career as a professional musician. With some funds, we'd managed to hide from the police, feeling it was time to find a more peaceful place to cultivate our spirituality. Gary and I paid our fare on a boat to the Isle of Crete. Arriving at the port of Araklion on the Aegean Sea, we rode a bus to the southern coast. There we found a place of wild, rugged beauty, a steep and rocky coastline inaccessible to ships and resplendent with natural springs, gorges, sandy beaches, mountain goats, and abundant sunshine. We had never seen so many caves. Amazed, we chose one that overlooked the Mediterranean Sea for our residence. This island paradise was a perfect sanctuary for fasting, meditation, and prayer. Before sunrise every morning, I climbed a mountain where I would meditate and pray until sunset. As I looked out over the clear waters of the sea, my thirst for enlightenment intensified like never before. Meanwhile, Gary was down at the seaside also meditating. After sunset, we would meet back at the cave and break our day-long fast with some plain bread. As we settled down to rest on the stone floor, we shared our realizations of the day. Weeks of contemplation passed in this way. By now, my prayers and meditation had kindled the spark of my spiritual craving into a blazing fire. From that lonely mountaintop, I witnessed everything in my life evaporating into that fire. I felt like I was being consumed by my yearning for God, like one possessed. But fate was leading me to a crossroads. One road would allow me to remain the person I thought I was an American boy from a particular family expected to go to college and get a degree who had joined the counterculture. Another road would lead me into a realm where everything had to change. I was afraid. I knew I was making a choice that would completely change my life. But nothing could stop me. I didn't know where destiny was leading me, but I knew that if I were to move forward in my journey, I would find a whole new life 
with a whole new identity, I had to leave everything else behind. The day was ending, the soft red orb of the sun dropping into the mouth of the sea. It cast a veil of golden light over the waves, which swayed and danced to its touch. The mountains of the coast radiated gold. The dome of sky above me glowed pink, tangerine, and lilac. And then, from my heart, a sweet, commanding voice called, Go to India. Why India, I thought. It's another world so far away. I know so little about it. I had next to no money and little idea of what to expect. But I believed that this was the voice of my Lord calling for me. At other times, I had felt the presence of God or felt guilt that I had behaved in ways to separate myself from God. But this was different. This was a silent voice that resonated from my heart. I was convinced that it wasn't my voice or my mind. No, this was God answering my prayers for direction. In the twilight, I descended from the mountaintop toward the Mediterranean, immersed in my own sea of introspection. I felt each step I took was bringing me closer to my destination. And as I climbed into our cave, I found Gary. He was there in meditation. A lone candle flame flickered, shedding yellow light on the walls and ceiling of our shelter. I sat on the stone floor at the mouth of the cave and gazed into the darkening sky, then broke the silence. Gary, something amazing happened to me today. His eyes widened. He exclaimed, Really, monk, something amazing happened to me too. Tell me, I said. Gary gazed out at the stars. At sunset, a voice spoke to me. Incredible, I asked. What did the voice say? It said, he whispered, Go to Israel. My mouth dropped. What? Shivering in suspense, I leaned closer. I couldn't believe what I'd heard. Where? It said, go to Israel. Don't you believe me? I braced myself on the cave floor. I also heard a voice as the sun was setting. Gary burst out, amazing, we'll go to Israel together. But Gary, I whispered, my heart pounding. The voice told me, go to India. India, Gary yelped. He fell silent. Neither of us could speak a word. Silence rose between us, and I looked into the galaxy of stars. To the heavens, I whispered, Yes, I'm willing. The cave was now dark, except for the flicker of a single candle. I turned to my dearest friend, and I said, Tomorrow, I'll be gone, maybe forever. Neither of us spoke for a long moment, and then Gary broke the silence. India is separated by the deserts of the Middle East, by thousands of miles. Agitated shadows from the candle flame danced on the walls. The passage is dangerous, even deadly. You have nothing, monk. This is not a spiritual quest. This is suicide. Please wait. Why not come with me to Israel and make some money? Then we'll go to India together. Minutes passed. I considered. But that inner call would not relent. Gary, I believe this to be the calling of God. I can't delay. Worry washed across his face. How will you get there, monk? 
I believe if I just hitchhike toward the east, someday I'll reach that land where the answer to my prayers awaits me. He understood my heart. A tear trickled down his cheek, wetting his beard. You have to follow your destiny, he whispered. I will pray for you. As the candle flickered its last, I lay on the cave's floor for rest. In the quiet of the night, I gazed out into the limitless stars, my mind swirling in anticipation. The sun came up and I prepared to leave. Gary came to the bus stop on the side of a country road to see me off. We stood among a few farmers waiting for the bus, feeling the sadness of separation beginning. The brotherly love we shared was rare. From childhood we had passed together through the mysterious transitions of life. Together we had gazed up at the stars from our homes in Highland Park, from the hippie havens of California, from our college in Florida, and from many places in Europe. We had pondered why humans hate and kill and opposed the Vietnam War and the treatment of African Americans. We dreamed of civil rights, of a world free of hatred and full of music. In our recent travels, we grew even more dependent on each other's friendship and support. But now the fateful moment had come. As the rickety bus approached, I wished to give Gary a gift, the most meaningful thing I had. Contemplating how best to express my feelings, an idea flashed through my mind. I took off my old black vest and handed it to him. I had worn it every day for years. To those who knew me, it was an inseparable part of my identity. It was also my most precious possession. The vest, Gary exclaimed. The two of us were like leaves carried by the wind, neither knowing where or how the wind would blow us. We shook hands and then embraced. With emotion climbing in my throat, I said, someday, if it's God's will, maybe we'll meet again. I found a seat on the bus, and as it crawled forward, jostling over ditches and potholes, I looked back. Gary stood alone. I knew that giving him my vest signaled the shedding of my identity, past and present. I decided also to relinquish the name Monk and use my given name, Richard, from that point on. The journey to unknown India, I felt, would be a journey to reclaim my eternal identity.